Welcome to our conversation with First Lady Rosalind Carter on the Equal Rights Amendment. I'm Dr. Meredith Evans, the director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum. This month, the National Archives is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It was the culmination of a long, hard fought battle to secure the vote for women and a major step in the broader fight for women's rights. I think this is also a good opportunity to talk about another fight for women's rights, the Equal Rights Amendment. We are joined today by two of the leaders of that effort during the Carter administration, former First Lady Rosalind Carter and Judy Langford, Honorary Chair of the President's Advisory Commission for Women. I'd like to just say a few words about these inspiring women who have been champions for women's rights throughout their lives. Even before Mrs. Rosalind Carter moved into the White House, she was working to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. When the Indiana State Legislature was deadlocked on ratifying the ERA, she persuaded the state representative to vote yes, making Indiana the 35th state to ratify the amendment. Once in the White House, she worked tirelessly to first get the ERA deadline extended and then to get it adopted. In her role as First Lady, she joined other First Ladies, Lady Bird Johnson and Betty Ford in Houston, Texas, for the opening session of the Women's Conference in 1977. She successfully lobbied the Pentagon to hire more women to serve as the White House Honor Guards, and she provided the President with a list of qualified women for presidential appointments and insisted he have more minority women be involved at high levels in his reelection staff. Judy Langford also worked on the ratification for the Equal Rights Amendment. She also served as honorary chair of the President's Advisory Committee for Women, and in 1977 wrote an article titled, Why Nice Women Should Speak Out for ERA, for the October issue of Red Book. She is well degreed, has had a wonderful teaching career, and she's also President and Mrs. Carter's former daughter-in-law, and the mother of the Carter Center Board of Trustees, Jason, Chairman Jason Carter. So with that said, we'll get started with a really great conversation. I'm fascinated and excited to, to hear all that they have to share with us today. Thank you. Ladies? Meredith, I, I think it's really wonderful that the library and museum is celebrating action for women that has happened. And I think that some of the ways that we have worked on this um, still need to be done. And I think Rosalind and I both have uh, always worked as hard as we could. But I, I, I hope that she'll start out by talking a little bit about her first uh, advocacy for the Equal Rights Amendment, which happened right after Jimmy was elected governor of Georgia. Yes, there were women sitting in the governor's office all the time. Jimmy had talked me about it talk to me about it, um, uh, women against the Equal Rights Amendment. And I was really upset about it. One day I was walking into um, some meeting, and one of the reporters from the Atlanta Constitution came up to me and said, Mrs. Carter, I'm sorry to hear, I'm surprised to hear that um, you're against the Equal Rights Amendment. I said, who told you that? I'm not against the Equal Rights Amendment. And he said, your husband told me that. Well, I was really upset about it. And um, um, that's when I when I had a big button made saying I support the Equal Rights Amendment. Walked down to the to walk to, to the well, I didn't walk to the governor's office. Went to um, the governor's office with all these women sitting in against the Equal Rights Amendment. And my button said, I support the ERA. And I walked through all of those women. It made me feel so good to be able to do that. <laughs> and then um, when Jim was running for president, my button really helped me because there's so many women across the country who were supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, I wish I still have that button, but I looked for it and I couldn't find it. When I was thinking about this the other day, I forgot how many different things that we that we did specifically to try to get ERA ratified. Not only the other kinds of things that Jimmy did for women, which and I I think he still holds the record of the the most women 
appointed to office during his during his time. And he certainly at that time appointed more women than I think all the other presidents combined That's before right. that. That's right. Um, That's because you and I and we had a committee that had a, a woman candidate for every office that needed to be filled in the federal government. <laughs> and um, and I think I see. You and I made a lot of difference, and we had a committee, though, um, that we put together to have a woman's name. And and you remember how hard it was back there, because Jimmy had a lot of judges to um, appoint, and there were not women qualified because women at that time had not been able to, to go to law school. And... Um, and we had to search really hard to get qualified women to be appointed for all those judges. I, th I think one of the things that I'm still the proudest of is the fact that Bader Ginsburg was one of those appointees. And she was certainly qualified and, and is still hanging in there doing everything she can to make sure that women have the kinds of rights that she thinks is important. And, uh, and that is directly because um, he appointed her. Um, I wanted to say another thing as I was thinking about this, about the, um, the President's Advisory Committee on Women, which I co-chaired. Linda Robb was the official chair. That was in the days when President's families thought it was Im improper to actually serve in an official capacity. But um, I think one of the things that, one of the other things that we worked on, and this was the beginning of one of the big changes in the country, was we went to and worked on trying to make sure that there were more opportunities for women in the military. And again, one of those conversations that I remember really well is going to uh, several military bases with other members of the President's Advisory Committee for Women and interviewing the few women who actually had dared and, and accomplished the goal of, um, of being in the military. And, and many of these women were minority women. They were women who had really worked hard to be there. And the, what the stories that they told about the military being one of those places where they really had equal rights. And that was one of the reasons that they had thought it was really important for them to, to try to be in the military. And uh, that was one of the issues that we worked on a lot at the in the Women's Commission. Yeah, I remember that too. And it was a big question. A, a lot of people disapproved of it. Well, a lot of people disapproved of of all the things we were doing for women, I think. And a lot, a lot of them were women. That was what was so surprising uh, to me. And women um, just just thought that the woman's place was in the home and uh, taking care of the family. And uh, we, we, had, we worked hard. We traveled. I couldn't think. I can think of traveling, and I, I think one time I was somewhere, and and they asked me if I would, if they could auction off a dance for me to make some money for the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> and I, I called Jimmy and said, "Jimmy, is it appropriate for me to be auctioned off to dance?" And I can remember him saying, it's better than being a wallflower. <laughs> <laughs> we did everything we could and worked hard. Well, that, well, that reminds me, I was, often, um, I was often the person that actually went to the legislatures where, um, where the vote was up. And um, Indiana was one of those. We were successful there. And one of the reasons, and I, I have a longer story that I'll tell at some point about, about meeting Maureen Reagan, whose 
father was not in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment, but who was a very active person who went to state legislatures because the Republican women were very much involved in, in working for the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, we met in a very interesting way and were after that, we went to a number of legislatures together. But one of the things that happened that day that really helped me understand more about what the effective arguments were for passing the Equal Rights Amendment, I, I went to all the Democratic legislators and um, she went to the Republican ones and the Democratic women who were with me passed by one office and didn't go in. And they said, this guy will never vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. We don't have time to fool with him. He came out of his office into the hallway and said to this whole group of women who had been working on this for a long time, I want you to know that I'm going to vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. And it's because I went back and looked when somebody told me that the law in Indiana would prohibit my wife from inheriting our hardware business that if I died without a will. And that would mean that my brother would inherit it. And I think that's ridiculous. She has worked with me our whole lives. I mean, it was a really passionate little speech that he made. And I, you know, being a guest, I had not been somebody who had tried to convince him for years about this. But all of a sudden, the reality of that in his life really made the difference in his vote. And uh, that was one of the things that, that really helped uh, Indiana be that last state that ratified it at that time. And I, I remember a time in Nevada. Nevada was a state that could, could go either way. And the governor was very supportive of the Equal Rights Amendment. But the last day when the vote was going to be taken, I was in the state capitol. Maureen was also there that day. And um, they had lined the halls with teenage girls who were sitting down along the hallways crying because if the Equal Rights Amendment passed, they could never go into a girl's bathroom anymore. And that was the most ridiculous argument that anybody ever made. But that was the kind of opposition that was that just made no sense. It was like, okay, now everybody is going to go into the same bathroom. And it just would make me so mad when I, I saw how people told those kinds of lies about what would happen if women actually had the same legal protections as men. And especially to do that to those teenagers just really got to me. Um, I had situations like that too. Jimmy was governor and we were living in Atlanta. And every time I would come home, I had one particular woman who would come up to me and say, you support the Equal Rights Amendment? I said, yes. She said, and you gonna um, go to the bathroom with men? I said, I do it every time I ride an airplane. <laughs> it was so, it was so <laughs> ridiculous what people thought would happen if that passed. We worked hard, but and we went. Like, we did work for legislators, legislators, um, and speaking to people, and. That was before I ever made any speeches, I think. I didn't know I was too shy to make speeches. And I think that's when I learned how to make speeches. Because I remember going into, um, the first time I went into a legislature and was called on to come and speak, I was petrified. But I did it and I was so proud of myself and after that, um, I started not worrying about whether or not I had to make a speech because I knew I had a lot to talk about and, uh, and how important <laughs> it was. You, you always did. I, I actually went up to Seneca Falls where the first women's convention had been and read Maya Angelou's beginning um, for a torch relay of women from Seneca Falls to Houston. And then months later, I was in Houston when the when the torch arrived. 
and the torch got brought into the auditorium and there on the stage, you were there, Betty Ford was there. It, it was really, Lady Bird was there. It was such a wonderful culmination of the celebration for women that happened then. Um, and I, I think, I think the presence of those first ladies and so many women leaders, so many Republican women leaders, I think it, when I think about it today, it's so remarkable that the Equal Rights Amendment was such a bipartisan issue. And I think that women's conference was one place where that was fully on display without any hassle from anybody. And it was really exciting to, to it see was people there. Exciting. I remember that. Uh, I remember that meeting. Uh, and it was so exciting because all the women, you know, our women <laughs> were so excited about it. And it, it was new and different because we had been fighting so hard uh, to, to get it, the Equal Rights Amendment ratified. And here were a whole group of women that were um, hanging in there with us. I think the funniest thing that happened, Irma Bombeck at that time was the prime comedian for women. And Irma wrote all these really funny things. And she was in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment and she would come from time to time, but it was really a big deal for her to show up in Arkansas at the state fair. And of course, the very first thing that the master of ceremonies did, it was a man, not a woman for some reason, was to ask her, was to tell her that the, the Arkansas mascot was the Razorback hog. And at the state fair, they asked people to do a hog call as a part of every distinguished person's uh, visit. And the guy asked Irma Bombeck if she would make a hog call. And Irma, to her credit, said, if you'll show me how to do it, I'll do it. And he showed her how to do it, and she did it. And she turned around to me and she said, I cannot believe that I actually did that, but I would do anything to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. That's great. Well, you know, back then, right. how shy I was about making speeches. I just didn't do it. And you know, I remember one day I was, somebody introduced me, and um, then they said, um, and then called on me to to speak. I was I can remember how petrified I was. But um, I think working for the Equal Rights Amendment, I learned how to make speeches, <laughs> which was really really difficult for me when I started out. I can remember going to. You, you remember going? Well, I think we talked a little bit about it going into the legislature speaking, and I remember one was yeah. in session um, when we got there and um, I went in and they called on me to speak. That was, uh, I, I was so scared and and I don't know, I think I've, I did it and I felt really good about it and I thought, I mean, I think that made me realize that I could do what I needed to do to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. and. But anyway, it was it was um, um, interesting and fruitful effort on our part to work that hard. Well, Rosa and I, 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 I can barely I remember when <laughs> you can barely remember what. When you were when you were too afraid to make a speech, but I I do I do remember that 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 was true at one point in time. But I, I also remember going to New York City, where all of the one of the things that happened during that time was that all of the women's magazines um, supported the Equal Rights Amendment and had a big campaign. I I was a writer for Red Book, and um, 
the uh, editor in chief, Cy Chasler, was on the national committee, um, the president's advisory committee for women. And the Women in Communication National Conference invited you to come and speak um, because you were such a champion of the Equal Rights Amendment. And th this was kind of early on. It was it was when you 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 know you were at the beginning of this chapter in your speaking life, mm -hmm. and you I was sitting like you know really close to the front. And I knew that you would be nervous about speaking. And you got up, you told books, you were so comfortable. People applauded everything that you said. You paused at all the right points. And you kept telling these stories that were perfectly told. And I, I was so amazed and so impressed that, that you learned how to do that. And it, knowing how hard it had been for you in the beginning, but that was certainly an audience that that loved you, and you certainly gave them everything they came to to hear. I think we did what we could do at that time too, and I think for me, you were the stimulus. You were young and understood what was happening and what needed to happen, and um, I think you. You made a, a big impression on me um, and kind of helped guide me through um, the work we did um, to, to bring equal rights to women. Um, I always was very appreciative that, that you were my daughter-in-law and helping me understand um, young women and the possibilities for young women, for women as a, as a whole. I said, I, I just want to thank you for what, what you've done. And, um, and to, to say it's been really great to talk about it again and to remember some of those things that happened and, and to feel like we've come a long way. Oh, Mrs. Carter, we're just closing out our session. Um, we're so thrilled that you were able to join us. Um, it's been a nice trip down memory lane, and it's been helpful for me um, as well to learn about the pioneers that, that paved the way for me to get into the position that I'm currently in. Um, so uh, with that, I will say thank you. And if Mrs. Carter, if there's any other story or thought that you'd like to share before we officially close our conversation. Well, it's been really interesting to me to look back on um, what we did uh, to get rights for women and how difficult it was, um, particularly with women being against it. Um, I was always surprised when I met up with women who were against it, but um, it, it's hard to change customs, I think, engraved like the one for women who had um, very few opportunities. And I remember when I was growing up, I could be a secretary, um, a librarian. Um, there were very few possibilities. And I remember wanting to be an architect, which was kind of interesting to think about back then. Uh, but there was no possible chance that I could do that because I couldn't get the education. Women could not get the education to be lawyers or architects or, or joining the pro, um, major professions like those. Um, so it's been really interesting for me to look back on the days that we went through and the times that we had, and um, um, with some success, I might say. And thank you for doing this, for bringing Judy along to talk with me about what about the work we did back then. It's amazing and I would say it's been a it's wonderful work that you've done because it's made it possible for me to be here in the role that I'm in and um, we couldn't have done it without the work that you've put forward. So thank you very much and we appreciate your time today and Miss Judy thank you as well and um, that's all for this talk. So thank you. <laughs>